What's going on, everybody? It's the Wrestling Perspective Podcast. It starts when I say it starts, and it starts now. That's right. Dennis Farrell, Lars Fredrickson. We're bringing you, a, a, at least I grew up watching them. You're a little bit older than me, but the Barry Darso. I am super duper excited about Barry Darso this week. Yeah, I think it's going to be super interesting to talk to him because, of course, when I was for, first exposed to him, he was in the NWA, uh, Jim Crockett Promotions. Uh, we all know him and, and love him as, you know, and from Demolition and maybe even the Repo Man. But uh, either way, like, I think he's going to be a great guest to have. Uh, and, uh, but, you know, before one of the things, our good friend, Ace Steel, uh, before I forget, before we forget, we're going to be doing a new segment maybe once a month with, with Ace Steel called 10 Minutes with Ace. We're going to pick a topic. We're going to talk nothing about that topic in 10 minutes or less. And we're going to do that maybe once a month, uh, maybe next first one, maybe airing next week. I don't know, Dennis. Yeah, I'm really excited because Ace is, you know, they're, they're guys that come on the podcast. We say goodbye and have a good day and they either connect with you or I. Ace was the first guy that reached out to me afterwards, said, hey, great podcast. I enjoyed doing it with you. He sent me a shirt. Nobody's ever done that to me for me. And uh, that that kind act right there makes Ace still one of the greatest guys in wrestling in my eyes. So, well, Ace is is a solid professional, a consummate uh, professional, solid human being is what I should say. Um, so, yeah, but yeah, let's do. We we got any questions this we, week? We have a few. Uh, okay. We're going to be up against the wall here with Barry, but uh, let's sure. knock a couple out here while we can. Uh, this comes from Top Dalia. Top D Leah wants to know when it's all said and done, what are your thoughts on Dolph Ziggler's career? Well, you know, there was moments where I, I first of all, I just hated the name because he was his rest, his wrestling skill, who he was as a personality was bigger than his name. But I, I always felt like that was the one part of his whole trip that just never, I could never just stick. That would never stick with me. Like everything else about him, 100%. This is just my opinion. Loved it. The name, stupid. Yeah, you know, I think his selling was so good, it held him back from moving up the ladder. And it sucks to say because a lot of people, you go, ah, his selling sucks. But the dude was money. I mean, still is when it comes to selling. His in-ring work is amazing. Uh, I you know, it bums me out. He's never really, uh, I don't know, carried a company on his back. I don't know if he can or can't, but he's always that guy that I wish did, had that at least the opportunity. I honestly think that if he had a different name, uh, he's as he's talented enough to carry that company. I, I've always enjoyed him. It's just I hated the fucking name. Stupidest right. name ever. Well, uh, Miguel from Reno, I promised I'd get to your question. His question number one for Lars. If you could make a rework a wrestler's theme song, who would it be? Uh, I'd probably like to do a Joe Hendry song. Nice. I, I, I would definitely, um, I, it would be like a soccer hooligan fantasy when I was done with it. All right. Uh, you know, Miguel, we'll get to your second question next week. Cause you know, we are going to try to get one more in real quick. Amber wants to know Mercedes Monet wants to be viewed as one of, uh, in the same light as a Kenny Omega and a John Cena. What do you both think she needs to do to reach that level? Go ahead. Why don't you go first? Cause I'm uh, trying to formulate. This is not going to be very PC, but I think wrestling world and fans are not ready to elevate a woman into that status as sad and as horrible as that sounds. And this is the most realistic answer I could come up with. I've been thinking about it, but let's just be honest, right? For whatever real reason, wrestling fans, there's a glass ceiling for women's wrestler and uh, women's wrestlers and popularity. And you know, guys, we put on this hero platform and level and we talk about them in a different light than we do the most popular women's wrestlers. And I don't know how to break through it for them. I don't know what to say or do, but I just think we as wrestling fans are not ready to have a woman that popular yet. Maybe. Does that make sense? I'm trying to it think makes, of the PC way to say it. 
Well, there's no, I mean, it's like, you know, fuck the PC way. First of yeah. all, I'm a punk rocker. So like punk rock isn't PC just in general, but, um, you know, it, it's, it's not, I don't think what you're saying is not per, politically correct. I think what you're saying is, is a true reflection of what society is in a lot of ways. Right. So, um, and you can't be faulted for that by just talking about it. So, um, fuck those that would actually take a shot at you for saying something like that. So fuck them all. But, um, I would say that I don't, I don't necessarily agree if, it, that they're not ready i just i i don't i don't think there's a competition between her and kenny omega i think she's a way bigger star than he is i think that's been proven over and over and over again i think honestly um you know i wouldn't even put kenny omega and her in the same sentence on star power mercedes is by far i think um a bigger star um i think that there's more proof to that that she could come in to new japan and do what she's done but i also feel excuse me the way that she's been presented like what that one match that she had in san jose that was the only woman's match on the card and that was why i think it was so special is because we were seeing something that was that was the build was was so anticipated just seeing that match put the spotlight on both of those wrestlers and I think that was a really good thing to do. Um, I feel like uh, John Cena, like, yes, he's a star, but I think now he's transcended wrestling. So I don't, I don't think he can be in the conversation anymore because he's retired. Basically he comes in to lose to Austin, you know, or whatever, but we can see him on the Honda commercial or, you know, on a TV show. So I, I don't necessarily know if you can either really I know he started in professional wrestling, but that's not his main gig. Let's just be honest. Right. It's like, it's like if me, if I was to say, yeah, you know, if I'm still living off of being in the UK subs, right. I haven't been in the UK subs in 30 fucking plus years, but yes, it's part of my, you know, repertoire or my, um, my, um, my heritage. My, well, no, um, I would say more of my, um, uh, resume, but it's not currently helping me in any way, shape, or form now, right? Because I've done something way different or same category, but bigger and different, right? Mm -hmm. So I think Mercedes is a bigger star than Kenny Omega. I don't think it's, you know, the people. Anyways, I don't know. I think she's a big star. I think she's very talented. And I think that uh, she will be up there with some of the greats that we talk about in 20 years. Well, I hate to cut you off, but we got Barry Darso, and you can't cut keep me Barry. off, bro. Yeah, cut we me can't off. keep Barry Darso waiting. If it was anybody else, we keep him waiting. Wrestling perspective at gmail.com. Feel free to email us any of your questions, thoughts, musings. We don't give a fuck. We just want to hear from you when we come back, Barry Darso. Listen, Lars, we're back. Barry Darso is here. Uh, one of the guys I grew up watching, childhood heroes. I, I am so excited about this we've had so many people come through this podcast from mjf to dustin Rhodes, and i was just saying off the air i this is the one i've been texting lars all week like dude i can't believe this is about to happen so thank you so much for hanging out with us for a few minutes well i i appreciate the interview too it was good good meeting you guys so listen i'm gonna start this off with just a simple question of feedback back in the day uh I've, I've been around the Impact Wrestling locker room. Lars has been around the locker room with social media, the way they tape shows now. Wrestlers get instant feedback. Back in your day when you were wrestling, what what was it like getting feedback? Were, were the generation before you very willing to give you feedback? Did you have to fight for it? Was it just something that came natural? Uh, yeah, are you talking like feedback from fans or from, from what? From your wrestling matches, how you were doing, what you need to do to tweak well, to get better? Well, you know, back in back in the day, everybody watched everybody's matches. And, you know, uh, when you're on the road for, you know, 30, 40 days at a crack, pretty much all of the guys have seen your matches and what they do. And and some of them, you know, will tell you the truth. You know, what a great match. Other ones will just say that just to be nice to you. But you knew who the guys were that were going to tell you the truth and would help you out or, you know, tell you if something went bad. But it was it was. uh it was really good because all, all the guys were, you know, really good guys on the road. So you, you got good feedback from them, but you never really got it from the fans except 
in the ring, you know, the boos and the cheers and at the end, that's when you knew how good you did. Well, has, you know, throughout your career, did, did any of the younger talent ever come to you for advice or, you know, was that something that you were open to, uh, to, oh, yeah. sort of, okay. Yeah. All the time. I, you know, even now we'll go to matches and some, every once in a while, one of the guys will say, Hey, can you watch my match? And, you know, they don't like to hear a lot of the stuff you say, but you got to tell them the truth. You know, you tell them the truth of what they did good and bad, but, uh, yeah, that's that's kind of part of the business. The the veterans got to help the younger guys out to keep this business strong. You know, uh, I guess looking back at the way the business has evolved, right? You were you were now in an era now where sometimes fans control how wrestling shows are written or done or what happens to a wrestling character. Is that a foreign concept to you? Grow kind of being in the industry before the fans had that kind of voice? Yeah, that's really foreign because <clears throat> when we created our characters and you became that, you made the people, you know, hate you, love you, cry, laugh. I mean, you could control the crowd because they really believed it. You know, nowadays it's like you're saying that, you know, they would write a script for you and you have to follow that script. And if the fan didn't like that, they would get you out of there and you'd have to have somebody else in there. So yeah, it's a whole different fan nowadays. The fans are so smart. They're almost like bookers now. Well, I wouldn't give them that much credit, but <laughs> um, because, you know, uh, but one of the things is you were able to kind of do different characters, you know, from, you know, a Russian to uh, basically like a heavy metal punk rocker kind of gnarly bouncer guy from outer space to a repo man, to all these different kinds of characters. And also you made all these things work. You know, when I, when I, when I go back to one of the, some of the first stuff I've ever watched you do was when you were obviously in the NWA holding the six man or wrestling Sam Houston. Um, d d were, were you sort of aware of the, of the kind of situations because you, you did that match with star at Starcade, I think it was for a, a vacated title. I can't remember the name of the title, but. I do, I do remember that match, but um, did you, were they really trying to elevate you and Sam Houston at the same time? Um, well, yeah, we were, you know, really we were middle of the card, upper middle of the card, no matter what, who won or lost. And what was great about that territory is you had the, the top, top guys, you had Dusty and Ric Flair. Um, then you had, you know, a few guys under them, but, what they had, the heels always beat the baby faces cheating. And then at the end of the program, the baby faces would beat the heels. And it did that all the way down the card. So if I was a heel wrestling Magnum TA and I got beat, then I would go down to the bottom of the card and then I'd wrestle Sam Houston or, and I'd get a win from him or he'd get a win from me. And then that'd move you up a step. And pretty soon you got back up to where you're you're beating baby faces on the way up till you got another semi main event or main event and then that baby face would beat you and it was like the whole territory did that in, in a circle so everybody was kind of equal except those two couple top guys does that make sense yes you know, i mean it was really a great territory for that talking about the creative aspect uh you know i look back on your career and you were a guy that had to get all these different characters over and you look at today's product where you have a wrestler that only has to get himself over or maybe a wardrobe change or uh, a small ideal change and not so much a whole revamp of who he is from the way his body size is because they don't give you credit you when you change characters you also went different body sizes right. at different times right. you you changed every single aspect of who you were in today's wrestling do you think something like wrestlers could benefit from being able to i guess go back to that throwback mentality of uh i'm gonna go from mjf to maximus whatever and i'm changing every single thing about me in a look yeah i don't know if if they would even do that nowadays because <clears throat> there's so many wrestlers now if if you're you know and a lot of them are using their you know they start off being somebody and they're 
they kind of created him as that person. And I don't think they want to change him. They want to keep him at that same person. You know, back when I was doing it, I think they, they liked me, you know, I got along with everybody and I needed to change gimmicks and they wanted to keep me around because they knew I was going to be there. And, you know, uh, I, I was good enough to wrestle anybody. And I think, I think nowadays the guys, you know, they make a lot more money than we did. So, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know. That's a good question. I don't know if they would ever have somebody have two or three characters like that anymore. They come up to you no. with the repo man gig. Are you just like, God damn it. I got to put no, this over. No, it was actually, I was sitting with Vince and we were talking about it and he asked me about it. And I said, darn right. I can do that. I can do anything, you know? And when you're, when you're sitting there with Vince and wondering if you're ever going to have a job again, you know, you don't say, yeah, I don't think I can do that. Cause if you <laughs> said that you wouldn't be there, right. you know? And, you know, we came up with things together about it and tweak things. And, and uh, he said, do you think you can get over? And I said, I know I can get over, but it, it all depends upon what he does with me to get over. I said, this gimmick isn't going to beat Andre the giant or, or Hulk Hogan, but it's going to be a good middle, middle of the card to get top guys over. I said, it's the perfect job for that. And I told him, I said, but I do want to turn baby face because I want to do a lot of make a wish stuff. And I want to do a whole bunch of different things like that. And it, it never did change to a baby face. And when I went to him, I said, Vince, we agreed that I was going to be a baby face. And he says, you're not going to be a baby face. And that's when I, I quit then because, you know, I, I was somebody that when you said, Hey, this is what we're going to do. I did it. And, and uh, I trusted him and it just never went that way. So, but, but anyways, uh, to make a long story short, um, that was going to kind of be the end of my career being a baby face and doing that stuff. And then hopefully be an agent or something later, but it just never happened. Okay. So I've actually never heard this story before and I would like to elaborate a little bit. So you originally went into that gimmick thinking, okay, at some point this is going to be a baby face because yep. I can use this to go do for charity and stuff. That's obviously something yep. very important to you. Yep. And yep. then it eventually it comes to a place where you part ways. Was it really that important to you to for for to to see that through? And I know that you yeah. said you're a man of, of your word, but why was it internally such an important thing for you to to accomplish? Well, the the way the gimmick was, it you know it was kind of a you know not a serious gimmick, but was a serious gimmick. And at that time, if you were a baby face you were over big. I mean, you know, it's the difference of, you know, 30,000 people loving you or hating you. If you went in a room, they wouldn't want your autograph if you were a heel, but if you're a baby face, they'd want you. And I knew if, if you're a heel, that's a, a terrible heel that, you know, took bicycles from kids and, you know, did all this stuff, they'd hate you worse than anybody. But all of a sudden now you start giving them out to people and you were a good guy and you were screwing the bad guys, these little kids in the hospital, they might say, you know what? I want to meet that repo man, you know, and bring him a bicycle, you know? So, so to turn baby face for what I wanted in my career after the wrestling, that was really important. And then I wanted to get on the celebrity golf team, you know, on the, and, and go out and play golf with the celebrity. I want to do all of that stuff. But it just never happened, and and it was because I wasn't a baby face. Heels weren't over like they are now. If you're a heel, the crowd loves you, you know. But back then, that wasn't how it was. Is that why? Because uh, you know, I've reached out to people when I had you on, kind of like I can't believe that we're about to get Barry Dar. So I'm I'm a slappy for you. And so many people would say, this is the guy you want to meet at conventions. He he makes you feel important. Uh, you you go up to him. He doesn't rush you out of line for the next person. Is that that kind of the same mentality as, you know, it, it sounds like being loved by fans were somewhat important to you. Yeah. Do, do you kind of pay that forward now into your convention days? Yep, exactly. Uh, uh Axe and Smash, we were just in uh, in England, Manchester, England, 
and we had lines of people and you want to sit down and talk to everybody and take pictures with everybody. everybody but sometimes there's just not enough time, but yeah, you try to, uh, you know, become their friends and do everything you can to give them the time because they're paying for you, you know, and some of these fans, they know your whole life story. And to me, it is great meeting these people and talking to them because there's so many different stories that they have. And, you know, you're, you're out there for eight, nine hours signing autographs. You want to talk to these people and make them feel like they got their money's worth. Well, I will say uh, from personal experience, and you probably won't remember, but we have met at a wrestling convention. Uh, this was some years ago. I would say probably at least 15. And was, I nice, of, was I nice to you? You were an asshole. No, you, were, <laughs> you, were, you stole my bike, Barry, um, <laughs> and gave it to some kid at a hospital. No, I'm just kidding. But uh, no, but you were super nice. You, you made the time. You looked me in the eye and you treated me like a human being. And I just want to say thank you. So um, fast forward. You know, one of the things that, you know, obviously in the annals of history, we're always going to talk about the road warriors versus demolition, right? Who was yep. better? You know, I mean, and this is like one of those those fortunate, unfortunate things depends on where you sit on the side of the fence. Do you think that at the end of the day, that was an emulation of the road warriors or were you, were you guys trying to do something a little bit uh, different, more flashy, more hardcore? Because I always saw you guys as a little bit more hardcore. I mean, yes, the road warriors were, were, were street, but you guys were like this high end tough guy. I mean, how did you really approach that knowing that this is what you were going to have to portray? Well, you know, what's funny was, um, you know, I, I broke in the business with those guys. I was really good friends. Right. And, and when I got up to the WWF and became partners with Bill, when Vince came to me with the gimmick, asking me if I wanted to do it, nothing with the road warriors was ever mentioned or, you know, we want you to be like the road warriors and, but you know, better. I never even heard of that. So I never even thought that we were anything like the road warriors. Cause we actually got down on the mats and wrestled people. But that's the you know, road warriors never did that. We'd wrestle the rockers and we'd take bumps for them and fly for them. And, you know, we, we were the team that worked with every team differently and we weren't just the strong guys so that's why i never thought that i was the road warriors now when the road warriors came into the wwf they were over big time everywhere else except vince's territory we were over in vince's territory but not their territory and it's like the fans didn't really know either you watch the you know wcw or nwa or you watch the wwf so when they came in there, we were baby faces and they, Vince wanted to make them baby faces, which I thought was the biggest mistake ever. Cause when they put us together, it didn't mean anything. Mm -hmm. it, it wasn't these two top teams are going against each other. It was just like they threw it together like a regular tag match. So if they would have kept us apart, kept us baby faces like we were, and let those guys be whoever the crowd wanted them to be. And then eventually put us together against each other. Then it would have been a huge match and it would have worked better. Well, let me ask you this. So you said that there was never any mention of the road warriors. How is this idea? What is the language being used to describe this gimmick by Vince? I, I actually saw he had pictures of what the gimmick was going to look like. So when I when I met up in his office, when I when I quit Crockett's territory, he flew me up there and he says, you know, uh, Barry, this is what I'd like you to do. And he had a picture of what the demolition would look like with that mask and the smaller spikes and leather. And he said, what do you think of it? I said, I, I love it. But I never even thought of the Road Warriors. I, I don't even know why I never thought of that, because it, it looked different. And, and then I said, well, who would my partner be? And he said, it'll be Bill Eady. Well, Bill Eady, I knew Bill Eady from being the mass superstar. Right. He was one of the greatest wrestlers of all time. He's not going to be just that strong man guy. He's going to be taking guys down. He's gonna, you know what I mean? He's, it's a different, a whole different wrestling than what the road warriors were doing. So that's why, you know, later on, like, you know, last 10 years, somebody says, Oh, they're, 
their uh, copies of the Road Warriors, whatever. I never heard that for 30 years until just in the last 10 years. So it's like somebody said that and then went, oh, right. That was, yeah, they did, they were like the Road Warriors up there. Well, you see, I never knew that. You, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. But if they, if they would have did that angle correctly, I think it would have been one of the biggest matches ever. And they did the same thing to Hulk Hogan and Ric Flair. Right. They brought Ric Flair and put them right together. And it was like, well, it was terrible. If they would have had Ric Flair be Ric Flair for about a year and Hogan be Hogan for a while, and then they go against each other. Now it would have been just a huge, huge match. Lars, did you have follow-up? No, I mean, I could go all day, but I, I know how much of a huge fan you are, Dennis, so I'm going to shut up. All right. So listen, <laughs> this might be a fanboy question, but there was always these rumors, and I'm not a dirt sheet guy, but there was – for, and maybe it's true, maybe it's not, but for many years, you and X, Bill – uh, had a falling out. I don't know if this is true or not. If, if this is true, what brought you guys back together in your later years? If it's not true, how did this get started? Well, it, it wasn't, it was a falling out, but it wasn't, you know, I, I went my way, he went his way and we've always been friends and it was just a business deal. When I, when I wasn't demolition anymore, then I was the repo man. So I, I had an extra two or three years out of that, but then I, I didn't want to wrestle anymore. And he went off to Japan and a few other places as the demolition and actually had another partner. So um, I don't know how many years ago, there was a promoter up in Canada that got us together on the same signing. And then that was the first time we said, well, let's get back together as a demolition and just sign autographs and do all that. And that's how it all started. And, you know, we're together two, three weekends a month, all the time with each other. So we've been best friends forever. What I guess I was trying to get at with my sort of probing into the demolition gimmick, I never saw it as a straight road warriors thing. I saw it more akin to what was happening in music. And I know Vince likes his heavy rock. I don't know what kind of music you like to listen to, but I almost saw it like a Judas Priest kind of like 80s heavy metal kind of thing more than like uh, street guys from like a sci-fi movie. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does make sense. Yeah. So, so was, was what kind of music were you, are you into? Like, are you into that kind of hard rock stuff or? You know, I, I like the Doobie brothers, Led Zeppelin, you know, that kind of stuff. And then I'm also, I like country, gotcha. but I like, I like the old rock, you know? Well, how, as a Russian, what would you enjoy listening to? As a Russian, yes, um, Willie Nelson. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you know, I wasn't really a Russian. I, I was know an American. I was an American that loved Russians. Yes, you were a turncoat, my friend. Turncoat. <laughs> I was the worst of the worst. You were the worst of the worst, my friend. And then not only <laughs> did that, not only did you change your last name, but you became a Khrushchev. A Crusher Khrushchev. Yep. <laughs> I'll tell you what, though, my one of my favorite gimmicks was the blacktop bully. You, you said you had Dustin Rhodes on the other day. What, what a great guy Dustin is. And one of the best workers in this business too, by the way. And when I had that truck match with him in WCW, we had so much fun in that match and we both got fired. It was incredible. <laughs> what? Can, can yeah. you tell, tell, did you get fired because of that match or was it just coming and that was the last match? We got fired because of that match. So I don't know. You ever hear about that match or anything? Oh, I mean, I remember the match, but I don't remember. Yeah. The, I was a young at that time. Well, it, it, we, we drove like 60 miles around Atlanta, had helicopters with cameras and trucks with cameras and, so we were wrestling, we were having a great time. And we ended up, you know, bleeding like crazy everywhere. So the office told us to get blood. So we ended up hitting the barbed wire. We did everything there. We were bleeding from head to toe. And they ended up cutting out a bunch of that match too. Ah. But, but, but anyways, when the match was done, we were in a, in a field and I looked at Dustin. I gave him a big hug. I said, Dustin, that was the freaking best match. I've, that was the funnest. What a match. 
We hugged each other. I ended up driving back to Charlotte. He went to wherever he his home was. The next day, I got a call from Eric Bischoff, and Eric says, Barry, oh, what a match. He says, uh, I got uh, good news and bad news for you. I said, well, what is the good news? He goes, it's one of the better matches I've ever seen. I said, well, what's the bad news? He goes, you're fired. I said, fired? I said, it was one of the best matches ever. He says, yeah, you weren't supposed to have any blood on TV. I said, this was an uncensored match. Mike Graham, who was our booker or or, uh, agent, said we had to be bleeding from head to toe, which we were. And we're going to get fired over that? He says, yeah. He says, but please, Barry, don't give me a stink. He says, I'll hire you back. I promise. So I said, all right. And I called up Dustin. I said, Dustin, did you get fired too? He goes, yeah, I got fired. And then Mike Graham called. He got fired. So (laughs) us three got fired. None of the camera people or nobody else got fired. And that was the one thing I said to Eric. So I says, well, I hope you fired everybody that was involved with this. He goes, no, it was just you three, you know. (laughs) So anyways, yeah, we all got we all got fired for having one of the best matches we've ever had. And uh, he hired me back after that, too, about a year later. So he was good good with his word. That might be the most WCW thing I've ever heard. <laughs> Isn't that something? Lars? Well, you know, one of the things I started thinking about, because you've been sort I mean, you've done five, six different personalities, if memory serves me correct. Um, you know, have you ever thought about sitting down with, you know, your partner in demolition and writing a book or writing some sort of like, uh, you know, I don't know what it would be or how it would look like, but I mean, you know, to, to do it as a tag team, I don't necessarily know if a book like that's ever been done, but has that ever crossed your guys' minds? Yeah, we've talked about it. And, uh, in fact, just this last weekend, we were saying, when are we going to start this book? Got to do it. Uh, Davy Boy, Davy Boy, and uh, Dynamite's book just came out. Yes, and it uh, great book. Um, but uh, it's just we don't have a whole lot of time, you know. I, I'm on the run all the time, and uh, you know, Bill's the same. It's just like I just ran out here to my truck to do this interview, and I'm off again. I did one earlier this morning, so it's almost like I'm working again, and I'm not. You know, you guys are killing me. Good. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah, so but but do us a favor, write the fucking book so we can have something, you know. You guys will be the first ones I'll send it to. <laughs> yes. That'd be awesome. That'd be awesome. You, you know, uh I kind of want to go back to this create creative aspect because, you know, you may not get the credit of being one of the more creative guys, but you were one of the guys that every time they put you in a position, you you got over. And talking about the younger guys and not being able to get it over, how I, I we've talked to wrestlers and they've you know the guy who taught them how to be creative or think creative is totally different from the guy who taught them how to wrestle. So who was the guy that that maybe opened your mind up to being a, a, a more creative wrestler? Um, well, you know I, I think it's kind of all been me because when I when I started off wrestling I was Barry Darso mm-hmm. and. I could not be Barry Darso. It was terrible. And Bill Watts, you know, he gave me the name Crusher Khrushchev. And once I became a different character, I really learned, because I didn't know anything when I was down there in Mid-South, but he taught me how to become the Crusher Khrushchev and to be the wrestler. And once I learned how to be the character that I was going to be, then I got creative with everything I was doing. So it was, it was like becoming demolition smash. I became that, that character. And what what's great about that is I could be the character in the ring and around the guys in the dressing room and everything. But then I was Barry Darso outside the ring. And I, and I think that's, it, it was great for me. And, and I think Bill was kind of the same way. Um, you know, when he was the mass superstar, he was the mass superstar. When he was Axe, he was the same way. It was almost like he couldn't be Bill Eady either. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? It's just, it, it's really hard to be yourself. But if, if you're a character, you can become that person. And then all the juices flow, you know? Does that make sense? Absolutely. 100%. 100%. 
Yeah, because, you know, I, I think about that Mid-South era with all of you guys, and I was an old tape trader, so, you know, even though it wasn't on my TV, I could get a hold of a lot of the stuff. Sometimes right. it'd be after the fact, and I think about all the talent that was down there, whether it was B. Brian Blair, yourself, Nikita Magnum, you know, Bill Watts, that territory seemed to like make these stars, you know? Yep, and yep. Do, do you feel like that class that you were in made the biggest impact? Because we're talking about a very special time, although it wasn't like, a, you know, a decade, but there was a few years there it, with the NWA when that place was the hottest wrestling place. Oh my gosh. Yeah, it, it was phenomenal. It, you know, and, and when you're in that territory, you don't even hear about the WWF at that time. You know, all you're thinking is where you're at and how you can better yourself there. And you're right. It, it made some of the best wrestlers ever. And, you know, we were all young and we had to learn and it was a great place to learn because you didn't go to the WWF unless you already knew what you were doing. Yeah. And, you know, what's funny is I look back at um, mid South when in Watts's territory, when I got my first break there, I watched old tapes. And I look at it and I went, holy shit was i the shits you know i didn't know how to do anything i couldn't do a promo in the ring all i could do was beat somebody up i couldn't do anything but i was with terry taylor yeah uh, george weingroff art cruz um you know and we were all young and they trained me in the ring before all the matches were happening that's where i learned and then pretty soon i'm wrestling terry taylor in the ring then the next thing I'm wrestling hacksaw Jim Duggan in the ring. Then I'm then I'm wrestling the junkyard dog. Now I'm one of the top guys because they helped me and taught me how to beat Crusher Khrushchev. You know, you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. And, and then after that, when I went down to uh, Florida Championship Wrestling, all of a sudden I thought, well, man, I'm I'm one of the best workers around. But then you get down there and then you get with different people and you go, God, I really don't know nothing. <laughs> you know, you, you learn with all these new guys. And then I went, I became partners with Ivan Koloff. It was like, this is a whole different ball game now. So that's, that's where the experience in different territories and wrestling different people is what made you a good wrestler. So by the time I got up to be smash, I was, I thought I was pretty good then. And I was one of the youngest guys in the territory at that time. You, you, I don't think younger wrestling fans realize how guarded the business was when you were wrestling back in the day. You guys were always in character. You never broke. It was very secretive. You wouldn't let just anybody in. Now we're in an era now where wrestling fans are becoming wrestlers. There are podcasts. There are books. There, all this information is flowing out. So how hard was it for you when the convention started up? You started getting asked for podcasts or interviews to let go of that past guardedness of, of keeping the secret into this new age of signing autographs as Barry Darso talking about your past, talking about these moments, giving these kind of interviews. You know, when I was just telling you about when we had to have blood for that match, I was feeling guilty saying that, but it's, it's out in the open now, you know, right, right. but you know, for years, we never talked to our opponents. We, everything was kayfabe, you know, and, and you could send a message with the referee and he'd go to the other dressing room and it was so pounded into your head that it was real and you had to make it look real to everybody that when I, when I got up to Vince's territory and the, the baby face and heel came out of the same tunnel, it was like, Holy cow. It, it was the strangest feeling. And then, then he said, well, now it's the entertainment business. Well, still it was really hard to be with the baby face when we were heels like, like you go to mcdonald's or something and sit there and if, if a baby face came in we would leave you know it was real hard to stay in the same building as them you know and then now it's like you know you still want to kayfabe but you don't you know it's it, it's hard it's really hard well this is a this is a, actually a question that i've always wanted to ask and i've thought about it but here here's my opportunity you're living this life where you're basically, it's like a double life. Now yep. you, you have to come home and live this other life at some point, yep. right? Yeah. Do those personal relationships become strained or not as intimate because there is this level of like, you know, I got to keep a barrier between 
me and this and me and this, because this is how I'm programmed in my job, living it 365 days a year. Like it does that. I mean, I, I I'm, I'm assuming it does take a toll on relationships, but was that ever like a mind sort of scramble for you? Well, for me, it wasn't because I was always a different character. So when I went home, I was Barry Darso, you know, and people would recognize you on the plane or whatever. But when I got home, it was Barry Darso. And I've been married 38 years. Congratulations. And thank you. And it, I, I think because of being those characters, I could be myself. I think that has really helped my own life, wow. you know. And what was tough for my wife is, you know, we'd be gone 40, 50 days uh, in a row and she'd be home paying the bills and raising my son and doing all that work. And I'd come home and I'd interrupt her life. And she'd say to me, when are you going to go back on the road? You know, <laughs> I mean, you know, not mean like, but it was like, I interrupted their, their whole system. But, uh, that what made it work was I had a great wife that, that knew, you know, she worked at home, took care of my son, you know, helped coach and, you know, did whatever when I couldn't be there. And it was just a really good, uh, uh, you know, what do you say? Well, a really good husband and wife. Yeah. Good partnership. And it, that wasn't like that for a lot of people. And Bill was the same way, you know, he's been married 40 some years. So, it was nice hanging around with Bill too, because, you know, he's 10 years older than I am and he's already gone through everything. So he, he was under control where a lot of guys weren't. Right, 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 right. Well, yeah. as a, tra sorry, as a traveling touring musician for the last 30 years of my life and a couple of wives later, it's like, it's yeah. kind of, it's kind of hard to, to, you know, you, you start to figure out what you can and what you cannot bring home with you. I digress. Right, right, right. Yeah. You, you, but you know, it, it was the greatest life ever. I loved it. Well, I, I was going to say kind of as a as a podcast, sometimes on this podcast, we mention things and things happen. Like uh, just last week, we talked about Tessa Blanchard. She gets a second chance, gets signed somewhere else. Uh, we've mentioned on different interviews about different wrestlers or different things or someone brings up something, then they get approached. You, why are you not a producer somewhere? Because I, mm. Maybe you don't want to be, maybe it's not your bag, but I've always thought that here you are, great in the ring, a great mind for a character. You could put it all together. You see a guy like Ricky Morton in Impact Wrestling. Uh, now, now it seems like lately, a lot of these companies are kind of reaching out to the legends. Have you been right. reached out to? Is it something you're interested in? Well, I, I guess I would be interested, but, you know, I... Uh... I, I owned a business for 14 years and I had a business partner and I, I worked my ass off. I mean, it was seven days a week, 10, 12 hours a day. So I kind of got away from the wrestling. And now if you ask me, you know, what can we do for a finish here or something? It's not, it doesn't come to me like it did 15, 20 years ago. You know what I mean? I'd have to really get in to start watching wrestling again. I, I know what looks good. I know what looks bad, but, to create a match now, the way they do it nowadays, it's completely different than the way we did it. So I would have to learn that all the way over, which I know I could, but do I want to, you know, I'm, I'm pretty happy with my retirement now. You know, I sold the company. All I do is I go on the road. I see all my friends make a little money, sign autographs and doing all that. I don't know if I want to get serious where I'm with the group where I have to be there on Sunday. You know what I mean? It's even like when I was doing this promo for you guys, we're trying to figure out a time. Giving me the time of three o'clock in the day to do this. It was like, you know, now for two, three days, that's all I'm thinking about oh, three o'clock. So it, it ruins your whole day up to three o'clock. Cause you didn't want to miss it. And I almost missed it, but, but you know, you know what I mean? It, so to go work for impact or AEW or Vince again, it's like having a job and going on the road again. I don't know if I want to do that. Well, we're really sorry that we ruined your day, but it's kind of a little payback <laughs> because you're a Russian turncoat or an American turncoat. So it's called karma. So we don't <laughs> want to keep you much longer, but I, for my last question, and I know Dennis probably has a last question, but the the scope of wrestling has now changed like you like we've all been talking about. Right now, there's so many ways to consume wrestling. Um 
Do you think that, that in your experience now, I don't know how much of a fan you are, or how much you watch or tune in, but you know, the way that we can get wrestling through the internet, through streaming, through, you know, it's on TV, whatever it is. And there isn't a copious amount of it out there. Do you think that's good or bad for the profession? I think it's good. The, the more ways that people can watch it, um, it, it kind of keeps the wrestlers honest too. They got to be good for people to watch them for somebody to get over. Now the office really has to push them and they have to be incredible at their trade. Otherwise the people are going to just, you know, they're going to be, you know, hate life and they're not going to have jobs. So yeah, having the podcast and the TVs and all that, I think it's, it's great, you know, and I watch wrestling every once in a while. And, and the other day uh, I watched WrestleMania with my grandkids and I watched Charlotte Flair wow. and I unbelievable. And I, I talked to her not too long ago and I never, I'd never seen her wrestle and I watched her in that match. And I thought that was one of the best matches on the card. It was incredible. She was phenomenal. And then I started watching a couple more of the women wrestling. They're incredible. It's like the guys are all doing kind of the same thing right. up and down, same moves and all that. Now the girls are kind of like how the guys used to be. And I, I really got into watching their angles and they're tough. Holy cow. So I know I got off the subject a little bit, but no. uh, you know, it, uh, to see these women now because of podcasts, because of the TV, because of all that, it, it's, it's changed wrestling. It's, it's huge. Well, my my last question, uh, Lars and I are both self-confessed demolition fans. We loved you more than Legion of Doom. Uh, well, I appreciate that, you guys. I love you, man. They, so with my question was, was there a, a demolition moment, angle, situation that we as fans got robbed of that you pitched or someone pitched to you guys that you were all in and maybe last second or it just got poo-poo that you thought would take you guys to the next level? Well, I, I thought when the Road Warriors came in, I thought that was going to put us to the next level. And we were really excited for them to come in because they were our friends. Plus, they were an over tag team. But the way it was all put together, it just was a huge letdown. And it was a letdown for those guys, too, because we've all talked about it. It was like, why did they do that? It, and, and I think what it was, was they were trying to kill us off. But right. the people weren't the people weren't letting us get killed off, and they wanted the Road Warriors over as baby faces, but they were heels, you know, and they should have kept them as heels because they would have got over as heels. So that was one of the moments that I thought that would have put us into a whole other category, and it ended up going the other way, it made us worse. And that was when Crush came in and all that too. Well, listen, uh, we could have you here all day, and I'm sure you one day you'll be back on the podcast with us because, once I, again. I would love to. I'd love to. You guys are great guys. Oh, so uh, as we wrap this up, I don't know if you have anything to promote. Uh, you you were just here for a conversation. We'd like to ask people at the end of the show, you know, where can people find you, social media? Do you have anything that you're trying to sell off? Well, you know, there's, uh, there's a new action figure that – a couple of new ones that have come out that are from England. It's, it's a round head on this body. It's phenomenal. Um, I don't know what the heck you call them, but they're, they're going to be out in a month. And if everybody can look that up and purchase that one, it's, it's well worth it. Is it a bobblehead guy? It, it's not a bobblehead, but it's uh like a Funko pop. I don't know. Yeah. Like a Funko pop. Okay. But it looks unbelievable. When I saw it, I just went, Oh man, you guys are unbelievable. So it, it's it's going to be here in a month. Gotcha. So uh, gonna, other I'm than gonna, that, I'm going to be. Other in than that, yeah. I, Go uh, ahead. Sorry. I'm on Twitter every once in a while. I'm not very much. It's at Real Demo Smash. Um, but uh, yeah, we just uh, we're going to Newark. We're at EightiesWrestling.com this this weekend. Up in uh, was it Morristown or you know Newark up that way? So if a bunch of fans could come there, that'd be huge. That's going to be a good one. If Dave LaGreca from Busted Open comes up to you, put him and in he a head, and he will, put him in a headlock and tell him that Lars sent you, will you? And, and where would they see him at? You, well, hey. he's he he's going to be at the New Jersey, it's at the Meadowlands, or not, or uh, not Meadowlands, but uh, 
It's in. I'll punch him in the chops. Do so. His name's Dave LaGreca, Busted Open Radio. He's a good friend of mine. Put him in a headlock. Give him a little noogie on top of his head and tell him (laughs) Lars Fredrickson loves you. He'll All come right. up to you with his New York accent and be like, oh, my God, Barry, I love you. And then you'll be like, oh, you must be Dave. All right. So. All right. Well, guys, thank you. Huh? Thank let's, you. Let's do it. Let's do it again. Absolutely. I would love that. We would love thank that. You. Thank you so much. All right.